Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hello and welcome to ATP Stories, where we share the stories of key opinion leaders in the Asian tech ecosystem. My name is Graham Brown. Today, we're heading to Singapore to meet Frank Lavin, who's going to help us better understand how we can get a piece of that $500 billion e-commerce market in China. Now, Frank is the founder of Export Now, a China e-commerce solutions company. Frank, welcome to the show. Thanks, Graham. Good to be here. Excellent. It's great to have you here. I think before we sort of dive into China, I just want to share with the listeners a bit about your background as well, because that puts it into context, because you've held some, well, you've had an illustrious career, which I've <laughs> sort of I've run through some of the points so people understand. You were the chairman of the Asian Public Affairs Practice at Edelman. I'm not going to go through all of your previous positions, so I'll just pick out some of these. You were the Undersecretary at the Department of Commerce, U.S. Ambassador to Singapore, Principal right. of the Bank of America, VP at Citibank. And you spent, if I'm right in working this out, a number of years serving in various senior roles at the White House in the mid to late 80s. Would that be under Bush Sr. and Reagan? Yeah, that's correct. I was with, in the Reagan White House NSC and then in the first Bush uh, in his in his Commerce Department as well as his son's Commerce Department. Right. OK, gotcha. So we're going to come back to that as well. I'll talk about that in the context of your journey, because there's a lot more to it as well. I've only sort of given the listeners a top level view of where you've been and the, the places you've served in and so on. We're going to go back to that, talk about that a bit more in depth. But let's talk about China. Let's talk about what you do in China so people get an understanding of export now and how you kind of add value to companies getting into the Chinese market. Sure. What export now does is we will uh, plan an e-commerce strategy and then we'll execute that strategy for international brands. So we mean a a consumer product company that has no China team at all, no China staff or or capabilities at all. We can get them up and running on China e-commerce, everything from inbound logistics, customs clearance, regulatory approval, all of the decisions and strategy on which products, what price points, which platforms, and so forth, and then run the stores or stores, do all the merchandising, order fulfillment, customer contact, social media, and then do all the back-end financial settlement and remittance. So you can sit in Sydney or San Francisco or Tokyo, and you can run a China e-commerce store that is essentially a China version of your home market store. So this makes China accessible, more or less, to any consumer brand in the world can now have a China footprint through e-commerce. And you never have to go to China and you don't have to hire anybody in China because we're an outsourced provider. Gotcha. I'm going to ask you about why we want to get into China in a minute. What kind of brands would these be? Would these be multinational corporations or would these be sort of mid-level brands? Just give us some examples. Well, there's a range. There's a range. There's I, I, What we have seen is you have to have a certain scale. You have to have a certain size. We'd say if you're purely a startup you probably want to get to a certain level of maturity, have at least to say a hundred million dollars in sales or two hundred million dollars in sales before you start thinking about China. So you so you have all of your domestic systems in place, logistics, finance, operations, and so forth. Uh, we've worked with brands smaller than a hundred million, so it's not a rigid number. Uh, the real question is, what's the brand strength? What's the brand message? Because even a boutique brand, say a $100 million cosmetics brand, can have a reach in China, hit a million or $2 million in sales in China, if there's real brand traction, if it really connects with the consumer. And the question I want to ask now, Frank, is why? I mean, this sort of opens up all the discussions about getting into the Chinese market, because let's talk about the headline figures first. Hmm. I've got some data here which I want to share. China is for the Chinese e-commerce market, not Chinese retail market. I mean, that, that's something else alone. The Chinese e-commerce market is forecast to become worth $840 billion by 2021, which is double the estimated size of the U.S. And the retail market alone, I think, passed the U.S. market about just under $5 trillion this year in 2017. So... Just looking at the headline figures alone, it's a very attractive market. Can you put that yeah. into some kind of context for us as outsiders who don't have experience in China? Yeah, what, what we're seeing globally is a move to e-commerce, that in every market in the world, in every demographic, uh, e-commerce every single year takes up a larger share of retail spend. However, in China, it's even more pronounced, meaning in the U.S., for example, e-commerce can be 10 or 12 percent of all retail spend. That's very nice. But in China, it's double that. It'll be 20% plus. And for the premium brands, international brands, it will be 30% plus. So what we're really saying is, look, you can reach 
thirty percent of your uh, uh, your your ultimate market, but you can reach that within a few weeks or a few months just by putting up some e-commerce stores, and you can do that without a physical infrastructure without, you know, setting up 300 stores na- nationwide just with one e-commerce operation right out of Shanghai, all of a sudden you're hitting 20 or 30% of your total market. That's not a bad way to start. What it does, Graham, is it reverses the sequence. What we see historically is brands, when they go into market, build out their stores, their physical stores. Then when they get to a certain size, they say, well, it's time to put an e-commerce operation on top of that. What we're seeing in China is you're probably better off Reversing that, you're probably better off starting with e-commerce, grabbing that 20 or 30% market share in e-commerce. Then as you validate the brand, you understand what your product selection r- ratio is, your pricing discussion and so forth, then you can start moving offline in a systematic way and you don't have to go through the expense of experimenting offline because you've figured it all out online. Okay, so how important are the services like Taobao and Tmall in that whole setup? Are these sort of like the, the go-to platforms that if you're going to get into China, you would go to one of these providers? Typically, typically, yes. I, I'll give you another example in that regard. In the U.S., about 90% of e-commerce is done through what we call standalone sites, Nike.com, standalone sites. But in China, it's the reverse. About 90% are done through platforms, be it Tmall, JD, Taobao, other, other kind of boutique platforms or horse or vertical platforms. So what we would normally so in, in China it's Nike.tmall.com is the official Nike store on Tmall. So we would normally with a new brand start on a platform. You can always have a standalone site, or what we call a dot CN site, and that's used for communication purposes mainly, can do some transaction, but you'll you will find most of your transactions will take place through a platform. Right. And the Chinese consumers they look at these platforms as the default. They, if somebody isn't on that platform, that's almost like a, an outlier, right? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. There's, there's at least uh, two things going on here. One is quality control and brand integrity, meaning Tmall and JD will only take a brand on if it is the official brand owner, meaning if you're talking to Nike.tmall.com, you are talking to Nike. There can't be a third party. If Graham or Frank shows up on Tmall and says, I've got a I've got a truckload of Nikes. May I sell them on Tmall? Please? They won't let you. So only the official brand owner authorized agent may sell the store. So the consumer feels very comfortable about that. The second thing that's going on is be, then, you have the, then you have the economies of scope, meaning if you're looking for a pair of uh, running shoes or athletic shoes and you go on to Tmall, you're going to find 100 different brands. So you're saying, well, I, I'm, I'm interested. So you'll, you'll, you'll get to Nike because you're thinking in terms of categories. Whereas if you were standing a uh, standalone site, you'd have to know the brand for each. You'd have to understand New Balance and Brooks and, and search and click through each one. So there's a lot of efficiency and comparative advantages working through a platform. Okay, so what I want to do is give the listeners some kind of context to understand the Chinese market. I don't know if we can draw a parallel. So for those outside of China, they may have, heard, especially in Asia, they will have heard of Alibaba. Mm. Those outside of Asia may have heard of Alibaba. I know they may be familiar with Jack Ma. He recently met with Donald Trump. We'll talk about that in a minute. Is there any kind of parallels? I mean, we're all familiar with Amazon outside of Asia. Mm. We're all familiar well, with Jeff Bezos. Are there any parallels there? Can we it, understand it, it in that it, context? I think there are some parallels. Uh, by size, Alibaba is bigger than Amazon and eBay combined. I mean, it's right. just massive how large it is because the retail market in China is larger than the U.S. Even though the economy itself is still a bit smaller than the U.S., Chinese consumers are more retail oriented and they're more e-commerce oriented. So what we say is the main driver of success in China, there are two. One is the law of large numbers. And it tells you if you get good news on that kind of a large base, good news any place in that system, you're going to be very happy. So meaning you can have a volume in China that is five percent or three percent of your home market penetration but you're still very happy because it's done through e-commerce so there's no fixed cost you're still getting revenue you're still getting market share you're still getting brand uh, uh, attraction in that market so that law of large numbers is a very powerful driver to, for success the other law we're seeing in china dramatically graham is what we call the law of convergence and the law of convergence tells us that consumers around the world tend to converge in their tastes if you hold even for income and education. So consumers around the world like Mercedes-Benz, they like Disney, they like Johnny Walker, they like Ikea. uh, And these are great global brands that have a real hold with the everyday consumer because uh, they're fabulous products, right? And in China is no different. The only difference in China is purchasing power 
and education will skew more more mass market. So the percentage of people who can afford an IKEA product or a Disney product is going to be a smaller percentage of the population in China than it might be in in the U.S. or or France or Australia. Right. Let's talk about that, Frank, because when people look at China, they they may look at it in terms of the, the, the headline figure. So in terms of GDP compared to the U.S., for example. So the average Chinese consumer GDP is what roughly these days? I mean, it must be about a sixth or a seventh, about 15, 20% of it U.S. consumer sure. at most, sure. right? Sure. But the interesting thing about that data is you're throwing together what 300 million middle class, reasonably affluent consumers in China with maybe 700 million, uh, you know, maybe rural exactly consumers right. in together. So you're kind of mixing up, whereas in, in the US, you don't have that kind of disparity, right? So if you were just to take those 300 million affluent middle class consumers in China alone, I mean, that's the size of the US, right? That's the population of the US, 300 million affluent middle class. Yeah, Graham, I think you've summed it up. It, it's um, on an average basis, China's purchasing power is considerably less than Western countries such as the US. But it sort of doesn't matter because that base of 1.3 billion or 1.4 billion is so massive. So think of it this way. Nike in the U.S. might be talking to or trying to reach 75 percent of the population, might mm-hmm. deem potential clients. In China, they might say, no, it's only 20 percent of the population is who we really think has the purchasing power to buy a pair of Nikes. But you say, that's not a bad market if it's 20 percent of China. And if it's 20 percent of China this year, it's going to be 21 percent next year because you have – Nice economic growth in that market. Exactly. I want to work work around to your view on China and the changes that have happened, because if anybody is positioned to give us, you know, a top level view of what's going on in China, it's Frank, right? We were going to talk about that because we haven't even talked about your history with China, right? First, before we get there, before I forget, I did mention Donald Trump, mentioned Jack Ma as well. They did meet recently. Yeah. I think the promise was that Alibaba was going to create one. I don't think he promised it, but it was mentioned. It was one million U.S. jobs by Correct. allowing American businesses to sell to China. I mean, when you hear that, do you think that's hype yeah. or is that reality? Well, look, it is an aggressive target, but it's not a it's not an unrealistic target. But it, it, it is a great, it's not going to happen in six months. Let's just say that. But here's the point. Uh, and I just came from the U.S. meeting with Jack, be, uh, coming out of this meeting. So Jack Ma meets with Donald Trump before Trump even takes office, just to sort of walk through China e-commerce. And what he's saying, I think quite correctly, is China e-commerce is a job creator in the United States because it's a mechanism to allow mid-tier brands to sell into that market. So, And he, Jack Ma, will make a commitment to reach out to U.S. SMEs to help them get into the market. Uh, that was that was a few months ago. Then what happened in June, this is where I just last saw Jack, was we got together in Detroit where he had this huge Woodstock, something like 3,000 people there and uh, brands and other service providers and VIPs and so forth uh, walking through. It was two days of sort of seminars, lectures, panels. I was able to present a uh, discussion somewhat like this on how, what does it take to succeed in that market and what brands should think about. And so we're doing a lot of cheerleading, so to speak, to help brands and companies get into that market. So Jack's doing his bit. I'm very nice to see, very proud to work with him on this. Excellent. And are American companies doing their bit as well? Because, you know, I mean, the policy directives may be different to, you yeah. know, the entrepreneurs uh, see the market opportunity, but there's still that sort of zeitgeist, isn't it? The Chinese, it's just ironic, isn't it? I think that, the, you know, there's been this sort of narrative that the Chinese are coming to the US and taking the jobs. But, you know, you have a story like this where Jack Ma is coming and providing a million jobs. I mean, are the American companies getting it? Are they open to the idea? You know, this is a fascinating question. What is striking to me is the range of international orientation of companies, not just in the U.S. I work mainly in the U.S., but we see in the U.K. where we do work and other markets, meaning you can have two identical apparel companies. Each of them might be $500 million companies, both American, both roughly marketing the same segment, say women's apparel. One will say we're in 10 countries and 25% of our revenue comes from outside the U.S., the other companies say, no, no, we're not outside the U.S. at all. We, we've right. never done it. So you say, well, why, why is that? What, why, why did Philip Knight decide 30 or 40 years ago, I'm going to make Nike a global brand? Why did Mr. Proctor and Mr. Gamble decide 100 some years ago, we're going to, we're going to make Crest uh, Toothpaste a global brand? And what was it about those gentlemen who said, we can do this, you know, and Michael Dell and 
Walt Disney and other entrepreneurs. And, and at the same time, for every one of those, there's somebody else down the block who says, no, 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 I won't do that. I don't have the capabilities. I don't have the experimental uh, mindset. I don't have the corporate culture. But it's really striking to me. But here's the, here's the shift in the last 10 or 20 years. Because of e-commerce, because of technology, because of trade liberalization, the ongoing cost of doing this continues to drop. And the ongoing benefit of doing this continues to grow. So those lines sh- sort of shift in favor of the firm to say, even if 10 years ago you said, look, I just can't do it. I'm a $100 million firm, or $200 million. I just don't have the capabilities. To say, fine, you don't need any capabilities now. There's, there, we'll do it for you. There are other firms that will do it for you. You can get in the game without having to put a team into Shanghai. We can get you online in China. So as those lines shift, we're going to see more and more companies get up to speed. That what was so exciting about the meeting Jack Ma had in Detroit is that people kind of get this in principle. Uh, sooner or later, they're going to get into the market to say, as the cost drop to zero, they're not quite at zero, but as the cost continue to drop and China's economy needs to continue to boom, sooner or later, we've just got to figure out a way to get into that market. Mm. So the business case is there. I mean, as, as you say, it makes complete sense now that there's no real argument against not doing it. Right now, now the resistance is, is sort of a personal or cultural thing that there's sort of companies out there which, you know, may not like the idea of going global because maybe it's something with the founder and so on. And I, I want to bring this around because, you know, I, I like this idea of these boundaryless entrepreneurs who who don't see any difference between international markets, even though there are differences and there are sort of localizations like mm. culturally, they don't see a problem of going from the U.S. to Singapore to China. You know, right. Well, I'll, I'll tell you exactly. You put your finger on it, Graham. We, we, we can tell you early on which kind of companies have a greater prospect of succeeding in China. It's those companies that have already gone to five or six markets. So the right. company that says, I'm already in five other markets, but I'm not yet in China. Can you help me? They, they have at least a baseline understanding of saying you're going to have to localize. You're going to have to adapt. You're going to have to make some changes here but you've done that you've done that five other times so right. we'll just do it the sixth time or the company says i've never gone outside my home market at all can we make china work well we we can i mean you still might be successful but there's going to be a little bit of a of a journey because that company has to think through your product slate might have to adjust a bit your pricing might have to adjust a bit the competitive map is going to be different you might be more mass market product in your home market, but more premium priced in China because of purchasing power. Your value proposition might be different. You might have a cosmetic product in your home market, but in China might be also viewed as a health related product that it get you know it, it it protects your skin or does something has some other health attribute, whereas in your home market is purely uh, cosmetic. Mm. Yeah, I want to talk about those those challenges in entering the Chinese market in a minute, especially, you know, the challenges that start with the company itself rather than the Mm. Chinese market. We'll come to that in a minute, but I think it's so important to bring this into context of your own background, Frank. Sure. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but my notes say that you took a a master's in Chinese language and history back in 1982. That is correct. correct. I, I know Mandarin and Chinese is, is like the, thing to study today but you were doing it in 1982 well before <laughs> anybody else you were an outlier come on explain I, to me what, what was going was, on here i was an outlier i'll tell you it was it was quite by accident graham i was an undergraduate in the u.s in the 70s and uh i was at georgetown uh, university in dc uh, school of foreign service and a little bit a little bit bored and i asked my academic advisor please tell me the most difficult course offered at Georgetown. I want to just take the most difficult course you have. And he came back and said, well, it's, everybody says it's Chinese. Chinese is the – and so I said, fine, I'll take Chinese just to see how far I can go with it. And taking Chinese in the 1970s was the equivalent of taking Latin. Right. Latin, meaning you were never going to meet anyone who spoke it. <laughs> you were never going to use it. It was completely an abstract – Exposure Did you have any experience people. of Chinese before you made this decision? No, no there's no family connection, no personal right. connection. You're simply saying, listen, my friend, you've got some free time in your afternoons. We're going to give you Chinese. That'll lead up all of your free time. So then it, then it becomes, uh, you know, sort of a personal ambition. Then you say, listen, I'm, I'm starting to get into this a bit. And uh, the teachers tell you, if you really want to make something of this, you better go to Taiwan. There's no possibility to go to the mainland, really, right. in 1980. So I went to Taiwan in 1980 for a year. I loved it. I loved it. I mean, Taiwan was quite at that time a much poorer place, and uh, they had just done away with martial law. They had just done away with public hangings. It was still a very 
button-down place, uh, but it was a wonderful experience uh, as a student, as a young person, running around a bit and just absorbing something of Chinese culture. So I very much enjoyed that. That that got me on that path where China has always been a part of my life and has really shaped my career since then. There must have been some kind of conversation you had back then where you were deciding to take Chinese, where people sat you down and said, Frank, come on, look, we didn't send you to Georgetown to go and learn this you know, alternative yeah. language. People said, why don't you learn, well, 1980s, maybe Japanese. Maybe oh, that- you're absolutely right. The most common response was exactly that, to say, you know, Chinese is an interesting sort of abstract kind of odd thing. Take Japanese <laughs> if you want to make a difference. If you're really trying to help U.S. companies or really trying to understand what's important in the world, you really need to get into Japanese. Mm-hmm, right. That, and the, the Japanese section at the university would have been five times as large as the Chinese section, no doubt. So why did you stick it out with Chinese then in the face of this resistance? Because economically, Japan at the time was the place to get into, right? So why did you then say, right, I'm not, I'm going to do Chinese? Well, I mean, I guess we're saying it wasn't primarily done. It wasn't really done at all for economic reasons or for practical reasons. It was sort of like taking Latin. It was sort of saying, look, let me just expose myself to this marvelous culture and civilization and start to learn a bit of Chinese history, a bit about Chinese society. And I'm not doing it because I hope to be selling in China decades hence. I'm doing it just, just for the journey, uh, intellectual journey to learn something. Uh, so that's what, that's what first attracted me there. And it's been a, it's been a very rewarding journey. So I would, I would encourage, I mean, as we all go through life, if you have the opportunity to devote some time of your life to a summer course in Chinese or something of that nature, I'd encourage people to make that effort to cinch themselves up and to jump into it. And, uh, and uh, you'll find it very rewarding. That's great advice. You know, especially for, people on the, the business side, it, it, as entrepreneurs, just having that kind of mindset. That's the kind of thing you can't necessarily learn from academia, is it? Just going out there, immersing yourself in a country and being a foreigner and being outside your comfort zone. Which Was that your first experience doing that in Taiwan in the 80s? Yeah, it was. And you're absolutely right. Part of it is the China-specific experience, but part of it is saying, look, part of the journey of life is the ability to get outside of your comfort zone and that there's a world of people out there, and good ideas can come from any place. And the more you learn about the world, the more you have the ability to connect with other people, to find out what they're thinking. Maybe you can help them. Maybe they can help you. Maybe it's in a business sense, or maybe just socially, or or some other kind of a, a part of part of a journey. But but you at least want to develop these skills to say whether you're sent next week to Buenos Aires or Bangkok, you want to have the mindset to say, "There's going, I'm going to be able to make friends there and find some kind of partnership for what I'm trying to do uh, so that, that we all come out ahead. Right. It's fascinating. I mean, I'm fascinated by your, your journey and your background as well. There's a few other things I want to throw in, but just kind of keeping on this track as well with, you know, right. you, go and, you go to Taiwan, you've studied in Chinese language. And I think the reason why it's important to talk about this, as you said, that experience that you've learned outside the comfort zone and how important that is for people today in, in just being able to deal with what is effectively a global economy. I'm just wondering as well, I mean, have you had sort of observations about people in China, people in Taiwan, people in the US? I know there's a lot of talk and the media likes to put us into you know, boxes and understanders as this and stereotypers as that. Do you see sort of a, when you go to places like China, do you see more similarities or more differences? I mean, I'm just oh, curious there, about your there are distinctive attributes of Chinese culture that are transcendent, that sort of permeate. Now, some people from China are more internationally oriented, some are more locally oriented, but but you can see right away. I worked at Citibank as a corporate banker for a number of years, and I was with the bank in Hong Kong. And I could tell very readily uh, that so most of the team are chi- ethnic Chinese, most from Hong Kong. You could tell readily who was educated locally, who was educated internationally. Uh, from uh, there's a lot of cultural aspects of that kind of conclusion. Now they're all. It didn't affect how capable they were of their ultimate success, but it did show you in their behavior and their willingness to engage on certain ways and how you had to engage with them. That that culture helps define us and and captures what kind of people we are. So you've got to have, I think, good antenna when you're in those kind of environments. Well, because the quieter person in the room might have as, as many good ideas as the louder person in the room. And a good leader, a good manager kind of, you know, pulls that out of the person. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, I live in, in Japan and, you know, obviously Japan and China have had a lot of history together. And it's not always good. So there's a, there's a lot of, you know, expectations about the Chinese from the Japanese, even though these two should really be, you know, common trading partners. And 
a lot more should be done between them. I think there's a, there's a lot of anticipation about what the Chinese would be like when dealing with Japanese. And I see it a lot with Japanese entrepreneurs. They're very sort of reluctant to go into China for these reasons. And, and But the, I, I often find this is that, you know, when you actually talk to people, individuals, like if I were to go to Shenzhen or Shanghai and I talk to a Chinese entrepreneur, there's a bit of interfacing to do. Like you talk about the cultural antenna. I've got to have a bit of respect for this, that and the other. And there's mm -hmm. maybe a few rules and parameters by which we can kind of interact with each other. But at the end of the day, I see the human being, you know, this person has a family, they want the best for their kids, they want to put their kids into a good school, they want to have a better life. And I see that kind of common connection. And this is what I see, you know, with with global entrepreneurs, if, if they can get onto that kind of level with connecting with people in new countries, they're onto a winner. Because, you know, I've, I have this feeling, I don't know, if I'm, I'm a Pollyanna, I'm, I'm too positive about this. But you know, it's, I feel that there's, there's so much more similarities between us, especially in the business world. And if you can no, with I, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I, I think you describe it very well that, look, there is, a, there is a common humanity where we all as human beings do have some shared aspirations and you can find common ground. But, but that's maybe a longer term. In the shorter term phenomenon, it tends to be more transaction related. And the, the goal is always how do we make sure this transaction is win-win and the transaction is disciplined, and if we ever set up a dynamic where the transaction might be win-lose, then that that's bad news because somebody's going to come out ahead, somebody comes out behind. So in China particularly, we're trying to set up phenomena so the, the, the person on the other side feels good, they got good value out of it. We also feel good that we want to repeat the transaction, and that's not always easy. It takes a, a bit of a discussion to get there. As we say in the West, you know, we go into these meetings just looking at a transaction in China. They're typically looking at a relationship. They're right. typically, I mean, it's it's even though we'd say it's just a transaction, the other party is looking this sort of as a job interview. Do I really want to be in business with you? Are you the kind of person I'm going to be glad to have met and glad to spend time with? Right. So so it's a it's more of a process, I would say, in China than it is in the United States. But boy, is it worth getting into and you can be very very happy with the results if you've got the wherewithal to go through that process well let's talk about that let's talk about the the challenges facing companies getting into china and maybe we can talk about you know what works what doesn't work success stories and so on you know i want to preface this a little bit from my experience you know here in japan and Starbucks coming to Japan as a good example. And that sort of interfaces mm -hmm. nicely with the last conversation we we're just talking about with, with culture, humanity, and so on. You know, when Starbucks wanted to get into Japan, Howard Schultz came to Japan and he looked around at the existing, what they call the Kisaten, the, the, the tea or coffee shop culture that they had there. And they saw a lot of people generally of a certain age, a category, which, you know, is an older age group, an older demographic going to coffee shops or the, the tea shops as they were. And, you know, smoky environments, et cetera, et cetera. So when they wanted to enter Japan, they brought in McKinsey. McKinsey gave them the report. And McKinsey said, look, Japanese don't drink coffee. They drink tea, you know, and it has to be a smoking area. If you want to get Starbucks into Japan, it's got to be smoking. And Schultz basically said, no, you know, this is how we're going to do it. This is how we do Starbucks. This is how we do it in the U.S. It works here. It works in Europe. We're going to do it like this in Japan. And it turned out to be the most profitable part of their global franchise per square foot, the one in Japan, right? So that's an interesting case study because it's kind of like, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's brute force market entry, but it's kind of like, this is our model. This is going to work in the US. It's going to work in Japan and we'll slightly change the menu, but it's still Starbucks. It's still, yeah. you know, it's still the mahogany or the, the dark wood tables. It's still the baristas in green right. and so on. Now, using that as a, as a model, does that approach work in Japan? If I was an e-commerce company, could I go into Japan with that sort of attitude? With that, sorry, yeah. into China, sorry. China, that China sure. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think so. In fact, brand integrity, as you described, is very important for the Chinese consumer, meaning uh, you're, better off, you're better off adjusting sort of at the margin. So you might have uh, green tea biscuits or something, so you have some local flavor uh, permutations, but you really have fundamentally the same value proposition. And Starbucks in China did pretty much what you just described in China. They kept that brand integrity. What we say is, Graham, there's one cup of Starbucks in the world, meaning there's one quality of Starbucks coffee in the world. The coffee you get at Starbucks in Tokyo is exactly the same as Seattle 
as Shanghai, as London, as Paris. And they don't, meaning they don't have third world Starbucks. They don't have down market Starbucks. They don't say, oh, we diluted it for China because there's not a huge coffee culture in China. They said what the Chinese consumer likes and respects about this is that brand integrity. There's a certain Starbucks experience that will happen to you when you go into Starbucks. And we guarantee you it will be the same in Shanghai as in your any market in the world. So the consumer can respect that. Uh, and, and, and there's, uh, uh, other elements of that experience as well. That third place model that Schultz came up with, which is to say, uh, Schul- uh, Starbucks doesn't turn tables. You can stay as long as you want. They won't say, yeah. my friend, if you're done, it's time to move. Uh, and the, and they also offer you free Wi-Fi. So, so it's a gathering place, especially for younger people that it's a little unseemly. It's a little uncomfortable meeting somebody in a bar, uh, it could be expensive in a restaurant where they do turn tables and say, if you're not going to order, you have to leave. So Starbucks, you can sort of stay. You can study for a test. You can chat with friends. You can catch up on online activities. Uh, it's not a bad place to spend an hour or two. And your parents aren't going to be that upset because, again, it's not a bar. It's nothing nothing unwholesome takes place in a Starbucks. So they've kind of perfected that when in, in China you have tend to have much smaller homes. And because you have single child households, that child gets an extraordinary amount of scrutiny. There's no place to hide. So you'd say the place to do the thing to do after school is go to Starbucks. Exactly. So they build up a kind of a nice cultural a cultural solution as well as very nice coffee that's uh, helpful and well well regarded in China. Yeah, very true. It's as relevant to a teenager in Shanghai as it is in Seattle as it is in Tokyo, right? As you're saying. So right. if if I'm a retailer going into China, I'm an American retailer. I've had mm-hmm. a lot of success back in the U.S. What do I need to change and what do I need to keep the same? Well, I, l- I love that question because the people who don't do well are the people who don't ask that question. The, <laughs> right, pe- okay. the people who don't do well say, well, look, China is just a big Ohio, isn't it? I, I, I rolled out in Ohio about eight years ago. We've got 20 mm-hmm. stores there. It's doing very well. I'll just do the same thing. And to say, listen, it's a di- it is a different culture. There are different purchasing. There's going to be a different competitive map. Can we spend a little bit of time on some diagnostics as to who is in your space already in China? What are they saying? What's going on in social media in your space? And what is your core value proposition? So let's spend a little bit of time just doing some baseline diagnostics and try to understand what are we going to communicate to the consumer? Why should the Chinese consumer fall in love with you? What are we going to tell him and her that they say, oh, this is a fabulous product, right? And so so we'd like to ask those kind of questions, have that kind of discussion. And what the short answer uh, is that the strong brands, the brands that have an answer to that question, here's the ultimate point of this product and here's why you should fall in love with me. Those brands that can have that kind of conversation with the consumer tend to do very well. Highly defined value proposition and it can be apparel, it can be cosmetics, it can be a household item, but they have something to say to the consumer. And these brands tend to do very well in social media. So another indicator for us when we're talking with a brand about can we go to China is we say, what do you fellows now do in social media? And the people say, well, we have 800,000 followers on Twitter. We have a million people on Facebook who like us. It, they they have a degree of sophistication about this communication, about how to court the consumer, how to have a conversation. And that's I think that's even more important in China than in the U.S., meaning in the U.S., the brand has 100 years of familiarity because it's been around. It's in every store. It's on every shelf. People more or less get it. They understand it. Their parents bought it. So there's there's a lifetime legacy of awareness. In China, it is brand new, and you have to be able to have some kind of conversation. And the Chinese consumer, by conversation, I mean it's not one, you know traditional advertising of 10, 20, 30 years ago was sort of one-way communication. Let me just tell you why you need to love me. The the That's advertising of 30 years ago. Today, it's digital, so it is a conversation where it's interactive, where the consumer, you might tell the consumer, send us a photo of how you use this product, or we'll, we'll share a recipe with you, or we'll have a contest of um, some regard, or we'll actually have a meeting of people who use this product in various cities, and we'll share ideas about this product. So it's a it's far more of a social activity and far more interactive activity than it is in the U.S. That's really interesting, Frank. I, th- I think what you're talking about, if I understand, is social proof, isn't it? I mean, if you take it in the context of the U.S., you have these brands which have generations of advertising and legacy. Mm. So you know, this was the the product that your parents used or your your mom used right. or whatever and, and therefore you're you're so familiar with it 
And I, I imagine this must be really key to a brand. You've mentioned Procter and Gamble, where their brands have you know legacy social proof. So you're so familiar with this brand. You grew up with this brand. You saw it on TV when you were a right. kid. It was around the house. You know now you see it. It's it's always been there. You trust it. But you go to China, they don't have that legacy. You know That's you're bringing a, yeah a household you're, brand. Yeah. You have to court the consumer. You have to, and some brands understand this. The Procter and Gamble's understand this. That every market consumer receptivity to the product is going to be different for what you just articulated: familiarity, cultural reasons, and so forth, family reasons. But in some markets, it might be very, very low familiarity. We're not even quite sure why I need a fabric softener. Mm. So you better explain to them. Actually, <laughs> a fabric softener makes your life better, makes your clothes better, and you'll be very glad you bought. But you have to sort of tell them a story. Right, so the successful brand, every successful brand has a narrative to it and can engage the consumer. It's not just yelling at the consumer saying, please love me, but it's having some kind of conversations. The consumer wants to ask questions and their questions are validated and wants to know about this and that, and you, you take them on a journey. And so the consumer falls in love with you over time. So do you ever get instances where brands go into China and the Chinese consumer reinterprets them in a way? They, they see them in a different context? Of- well, we see this. We, I'll tell you, the, the real big uh, brands know this and do this. For example, we'll see a, an advertisement for a beer, just an ordinary you know, mass market beer in the United States, where one of the main themes typically is collegiality, fraternity. This is a beer that you enjoy with your friends, and you're sort of just at the end of a work week or a night out, whatever, you're having a beer, and this is a nice way to, to get together with your colleagues. In in China, you'll typically see something like this beer is what you use to celebrate business success. So this beer is the appropriate mark of a successful businessman and it has much more to do with professional accomplishment than collegiality so it's the exact same product but it's positioned a little different in the market to say this signifies a triumph of sorts right Mm. rather than rather than just goodwill and and telling a joke with your friends so that's an opportunity isn't it for brands getting into china to almost throw off a little bit of their legacy if if for example in the u.s they were in a category and they were the number three or number four and a challenger brand they could get into China, and it may be more of a, a you know virgin territory for them that they can establish themselves as the, the key brand there. Does that happen, or is that sort of wishful thinking on the brand manager's well, behalf? Well, I, I think I'd say this: that brands' ability to position themselves in the market can be uneven. Some brands are more nimble and would take what we've just been discussing, would say, "Yeah, you're right. We've got to think this through." And other brands are dogmatic. Other brands simply say, this is what we are, and everybody needs to love us for exactly the same reason, mm. and this has always worked for us. And to say, look, if you're, if you're 100% dogmatic, you have no flexibility on this, you might be missing out on connecting with some consumers. And then you peel that away and you say, why, why do you believe this, that this is the only reason the consumer should love you? And they frequently say, well, we've been doing this for 40 years, but only in our home market, only in one market we've been doing it for 40 years. And this is why people love us. And as you point out, people might – People might like you for a slightly different reason in China. There might be a, I mean, you know, a brand that did this in the domestic market, we also see in China, is Nike, which began as performance athletic wear, buy our shoes because you'll run fat, you'll run better. Then it became a lifestyle brand. Yeah. This is an aspirational lifestyle brand. But if you enjoy athletics, it says something about you as a person. So you're very comfortable with a, a shirt that has a Nike logo on it because it signifies something about you. And now Nike very successfully straddles both consumer segments of performance and athletics and youth lifestyle. So they've done just a very nice job, I think, in sort of broadening the position. Not, re- not They haven't moved away from one, but they've taken it beyond pure athletics. And Under Armour is doing the same thing, that now it's a lifestyle brand as much as an athletic performance brand. Well, with these brands, especially these lifestyle brands that have invested heavily in their brand over a number of years and really that is the key differentiator between them and the next guy Mm. there's something i want to talk about and i know it could be the subject of a whole different podcast as well because it's a huge area we talk about ip and that Mm. must be one of the key concerns for any brand going into china you know if, if i was to go into china you know they're gonna find my products they're going to copy my products and you know you have the and i read one of your posts and you, you published some great articles by the way on linkedin and i'll put the details or in the okay. show notes yeah. uh, you know a prada factory or a fake prada factory sorry in china can knock out three thousand bags a year you know these yeah. guys are set up they can copy right. this stuff and they can you know within 
a matter of time, we're talking within a matter of weeks, they could be up and running and sure. knocking out fakes. IP is unprotected. That is the concern of any brand getting into China. And you must have heard this a number of oh, times. Yeah, no, no, we, we deal with this issue regularly. Well, well I'd say a few things. For, first, I think your description is generally accurate. I mean, there, you will encounter IP issues in China that you don't encounter in every other market. This is a solved issue, so to speak, in all other uh, developed markets. So China is the only large market where you have sort of rampant or systematic IP issues. So it's a real shock for a lot of brands because they, they say we're 10 markets. You know, we're in Japan, Germany, Mexico. And we've never encountered this. Fair enough. So it's a sweet, generous uh, point one. But point two, what I think most people can see it is the best defense is a good offense. You better get in the market as aggressively as you can selling the official products through your channels, and that right away starts to squeeze the bad guys. And we've seen IP theft drop dramatically once the real product is available, meaning if you're not in the market at all, then 100% of the field is available to the, th mm -hmm. the thieves. As soon as you're in the market, at least those consumers who have a little bit of money and a little bit of, you know, they're a little bit particular about the product, they'll say, well, yeah, I don't mind paying a dollar more for the official product. I'm not going to buy the, the knockoff product. So you start to squeeze the, uh, the, the, the IP thieves once you get in there. That's that segment. But then beyond that, you do need to have some kind of program or activity where you're pushing, 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 always trying to push these guys back. And uh, e-commerce helps you do that. The legal system continues to improve, and we use that as well. And what we found is the IP thieves tend to just be opportunistic. It's almost like shoplifters. If you have a store that has cameras and posted cameras saying we prosecute shoplifters and you have another store that doesn't do that, well, the shoplifters all gravitate toward the, the poorly run store, unfortunately, and that fellow suffers for it. But in the store where you have proper protection and proper policing, the shoplifter say it's not, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. This fellow's watching us, and we're just not going to play around with that. So that's you have to start putting that system in place. Right. Okay, they move on. The, the simple things that you can do and right, processes sorry, that you can sorry. go through, boxes sorry, that need to be checked, right? Right, right, right. Exactly right. We say you have to start policing. So, for example, and, and by the way, a lot of companies do this, leave aside IP issues, a lot of companies do this for price integrity reasons or other kind of reasons, meaning – you will find U.S. brands running around the U.S. just checking stores where the product is sold to say, are you yanking products so that they're not sold after the use by date? Are you monitoring that? Are you pricing fairly? Because some, some, especially with high fashion, Hermes will have very strict guidelines on this is what you must sell an Hermes scarf at. We don't want price competition. We don't want two for one day of Hermes scarves, right? These are luxury products. So they police that. Right, So a lot of brands do that in China as well, as you would expect. We simply say, well, add IP to this as well. Set up a secret shopper program. Set up a monitoring program. We can look across all e-commerce platforms and see what prices these things are at. We can then start buying through uh, through other third-party names. So we buy the products. See if this is really the genuine product or not. So put a little bit of effort into that so you're policing the system. Frank, it's been fascinating, the walk through Chinese e-commerce market. There's so much more that we can talk about. I mean, the last point alone about IP and protecting your IP in China, that's the subject of maybe a series of podcasts. We've got so much to talk yeah. about. Before I let you go, there's something that I want to ask you about. You travel a lot. Sure. Yeah. I guess you spend a lot of time on the plane. I'm reading your posts as well. <laughs> a lot of the time up in the air. I had a look at your reading list, your recommended reading list for on a flight. And I don't know if you remember it, but I don't want to ambush you, but I'm sure right. it's all done in good faith. You've got some really interesting books on there and some of which I've read myself and I thoroughly recommend. But this is what's really interesting. I kind of want to put you on the spot a little bit here, Frank. You've got two very interesting books, which kind of like on surface, they don't kind of sit together. You've got the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Right. And next to that, you've got Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas by Hunter S. Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, me, to me, they're like poles apart. Explain yourself. Well, we're, well look, and, and as you can imagine, we're not endorsing Hunter Thompson's uh, lifestyle. <laughs> but, but what we're trying to say is this, the, the, the article, as you recall, is what makes a good airplane book. And we right. said what makes you an airplane book is something you could read or company get through in a few hours – and it was it was weighty enough or meaningful enough. You were glad afterwards you read it, uh, but it wasn't so so complicated, so big that that even after a few hours on it. So we're saying something reasonably short, but had enough meat to it. And that Las Vegas book has it. It's a heck of a story. He's uh, you know he's one of these gonzo journalists. He's 
writing about modern America sort of in the 40 years ago and the uh, all of the throes of uh, the Nixon administration, Watergate, the Vietnam War, drug culture. I mean, it's a lot of uh, a lot of craziness at that time. He sort of captures it. So it's a heck. It's a very vivid storyteller. Uh, that's why I'd recommend the Hunter Thompson. The Benjamin Franklin book is just a fabulous autobiography. He writes this. It's not a political statement. It's not talking about American independence of the war, but he's just talking about his own childhood, born into poverty. Has to doesn't even finish primary education. Has to start working as a very young person. You know, on the starts on the docks. Fortunately, gets sent to work for a printer, a bookbinder, as a young man. So he learns to read. He becomes a bit of a bookworm. He educates himself, and the rest is history. But it's a fabulous lesson about self improvement and struggling against sort of you know fate wasn't very kind to him. Uh, he wasn't dealt a very good hand, but he made a great deal out of what he was dealt. So it was a sort of an uplifting story as well. Yeah, yeah. Unlike yourself, to draw the analogy, well traveled <laughs> and well and well traveled. I thought, thank God you're not saying just like myself. You're with Hunter Thompson, Las Vegas. Causing trouble, <laughs> Maybe a bit of both. Let's yeah. see. It'll come out. Maybe when we do podcast number two. We get a, a a more deeper dive into your background. But Frank, it's been fascinating. I really appreciate you coming on and giving us uh, a one on one in Chinese e-commerce market. I mean, it's such a big market. We couldn't really do it justice in the short time that we had. You know, there's much more to be discussed. And as we're seeing, I mean, what's really fascinating where we are right now is that there's so much now happening on the global stage about China. Like we talked about with Jack Ma and Donald Trump, there's now news which, you know, it was an e-commerce market, which was really just a domestic affair. Right. But now we're starting to see it spill out and it's happening globally. So people have to know about this market and have to get educated about it. So there's so much more that we can talk about on that. Thanks. Thanks so much. If I may also, Graham, besides LinkedIn, what I've been doing for the last year or so is posting on four. I have a column in Forbes on China e-commerce. So please look at Forbes.com. There's more on there. There's something. There's material on LinkedIn. And you're absolutely right. China e-commerce means there's a new planet in the solar system. And we all ought to take advantage of the gravitational pull of that planet. Exactly. We'll put all the details in the show notes. And of course, export now. Link www.exportnow.com. Love. We'd love to chat with you. Love to see you. Fantastic. That's Frank Lavin, everybody, the founder and chairman of Export Now, and all round good guy, well read, well travelled, well educated. He's got everything. He checks all the boxes. But there's so much more that we can learn. You know, Frank, I want you to come back on the show and give us an update. As Graham, I'll be thing. back. I love, I love the show. I love your chat. I love your enthusiasm. It's contagious. I share it, and I'd, I'd be delighted to come back anytime, my friend. Let, let me know. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.